<laughs> Committee of the Whole will please come back to order. Oh, yeah, he was a screwed up individual. But this guy was supposed to be his friend? I have to look for that. I wonder who that was. Oh. This guy had no friends. Well, everybody's got friends. It's like everybody was Martin Luther King's roommate. What are... What our plan for the next little bit is that uh, we're going to first hear from the Department of Health, and uh, then after that, uh, I would bring to everybody's attention that the uh, the administration just uh, submitted and passed out this. Uh, this one page sheet, which is 2014 to 15 recommended budget for HHS, it's, it's their recommended update based on the passage of the HHS levy. And we're going to have uh, Director Merriman make a, make a presentation to give us an overview on that so that we uh, we have some sense of that information going into the hearing on the, uh, the executives, HHS agencies. And, uh, and that'll take us to the lunch break. So if there's any of those uh, administrative HHS agencies that uh, have things to do and don't want to sit here and, and watch the action, you can uh, you can go back and come back at one o'clock. So, uh, uh, and and I would also uh, mention we are are continuing to uh, to run slow. Uh, I I personally have no evening meetings tonight. I I don't I don't know about anybody else. I have to ring. I have to, I, I have to ring handbells at six thirty, Mr. B Mr. Miller. And and. You know, if, 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 if anybody says we're going to hear the agencies and, we're, and then we're not going to have the council discussion of, uh, of suggestions and comments, uh, I, I'm just not going to hear it. We're, it would put us too far behind schedule. We've got to get through it. So uh, with that, the director of health is next. Please come forward. Uh, Mr. Mr. Terry Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of council. I'll be very brief. Uh, you have your materials in front of you. I don't have uh, slides to present. Um, I watched some of the video and I'm going to uh, the uh, previous presentations and try to be very brief and to the point. Uh, I have with me today our fiscal officer, uh, Judy Wershing, who will be here to uh, answer uh, questions that may pertain to her should they arise. Uh, briefly, uh, background information. Uh, we've been around since 1919, 1919 sort of post-Spanish flu pandemic. We are arms of the state. We are authorized to exist through the state health department. Uh, our board, uh, our, our appointed members are appointed by a district advisory council that appoints four members uh, and the district advisory council is comprised of the village and township mayors and trustees and uh, the office of the county executive. They appoint four members, a district licensing council established under Ohio revised code also appoints a member of the Board of Health and the District Licensing Council is comprised of entities that we regulate. We serve about 860,000 people in 57 communities. Uh, the City of Cleveland and Shaker have their own separate health departments. At one time there were um, separate health departments in the City of Lakewood, in the City of East Cleveland, in the City of Cleveland Heights since about 1990. Uh, those three departments are now contracting with us uh, for services through their uh, city councils. We have 36 city contracts that we have to negotiate with cities individually annually. And uh, the 19 villages and two townships are part of our general health district. Uh, a correction, we have 145 employees plus seasonal employees. We are down about 25% since 2008 uh, due to uh, recessional losses as well as uh, school contract work that we used to uh, provide. We provided uh, a range of school contract services with nurses and clinic aides and uh, LPNs. 
uh, to a range of schools. Uh, private industry has largely assumed that role. Uh, and so we've moved uh, out of delivering that service directly. Our budget uh, re request is uh, to our board is at about 22.3 million, about 300,000 less uh, than um, last year. And we're about 50% grants in terms of uh, how our dollars roll. Our organizational structure is listed. We have a, um, uh, we have a prevention and wellness wing that provides a whole range of services. And, uh, what I provided to you is a whole list of, for reference later, a list of the range of services that we provide to the communities, um, environmental public health services, and our administration that uh, is comprised of legal, fiscal, um, organizational development, and epidemiology, uh, surveillance, and informatics services. In terms of a range of programs, uh, you'll see uh, in our community and family services things that include providing comprehensive immunization services to children, families, adults. That we do uh, 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 under contract through Health and Human Services, um, things like lead poisoning prevention, family planning services, uh, healthy homes programs, indoor quality. Um, Ryan White, which we now do, which was formerly uh, the responsibility of Cuyahoga County, and we are now working um, uh, to provide that service uh, and asked to assume that a number of years ago. Community assessments, we track reportable diseases, everything from salmonella to syphilis to a range of encephalitis, a range of uh, diseases are tracked and reported by community providers to us. We respond to outbreaks, um, a range of uh, services around tobacco use uh, and exposure reduction, and uh, child fatality review, uh, working with Health and Human Services uh, under health education programs, working um, around teen pregnancy prevention, prevent premature fatherhood, working as we heard on opiate, uh, we, we coordinate the opiate task force, working collectively with agencies uh, throughout the community, uh, the medical examiner, uh, the mental health board, justice services, and a range of community providers, uh, working on what is a, a major problem, obviously has been uh, illuminated by this group. Um, still have a few school health uh, uh, services that we provide and uh, dental sealing programs in a number of school districts for children. Um, you'll see a range of environmental programs that include food safety, uh, drinking water, um, as well as uh, dealing with solid waste and uh, surface water management and a range of inspection programs and you can review those uh, at your leisure. We also do some regional activities. We're finding that as dollars are being reduced that we're being asked to take on a larger service area Oftentimes the dollars are being released at a uh, 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 amount that's been uh, static, but that we're asked to cover multiple counties. We do uh, a dental options program linking people uh, for non-emergency dental service in 14 counties. Uh, by example, we do bathing beach sampling in a couple counties. Uh, Smoke-Free Workplaces Act, uh, statewide bill that was passed in 2006. We do uh, compliance for three counties. Um, we do uh, emergency preparedness coordinating activities in five counties as examples, and we administer a breast and cervical cancer screening and treatment program in seven counties. Uh, a number of these programs will be affected by the Affordable Care Act as the rollout uh, comes forward. We expect uh, potentially that Ryan White will be impacted by that. We expect that um, the breast and cervical cancer program and our Bureau for Children with Medical Handicaps programs, that those folks where eligible will be enrolled um, in the Affordable Care Act over time. In terms of a budget review, uh, you'll see in terms of revenue, uh, we have about 15% uh, coming from the city contracts that we have with our individual contract communities, uh, uh, federal, state, and local funds at about 53%, license permits fees at 15%, and charges for various services like vaccines. Uh, we deliver some lead risk assessments in communities under contract, uh, things of that nature. Um, we also, uh, in terms of expenditures, we have a range of uh, personal services at 40%, services and charges at 5%, grants, subcontracts services. We have a lot of a range of community subcontractors that deliver uh, services for us, um, supplies and materials and capital outlays at 2 and 1% respectively. Uh, in terms of funding that we receive from Cuyahoga County, uh, a range of uh, programs through Health and Human Services, uh, the Planning Commission, uh, Justice Affairs, uh, and county administration for newborn home visiting starting point, uh, child fatality review, responsible sexual behavior, prevent premature fatherhood, solid waste management, um, urban area security initiative, and uh, building operations support that we receive in a 20 year contract for our building that was built in 2003 uh, that will sunset in 
2023, I believe. Uh, we also give money back to the county uh, for construction, demolition, debris, disposal, tipping fees that are remitted back to the county, as well as that has a reduction in healthy homes, dollars that go uh, to uh, Department of Development, working with them to uh, uh, repair homes and remediate hazards like lead and moisture, uh, mold problems and the like. We have about 28 funders that we receive funding from and are uh, uh, constantly looking for external grants. As I said, we're over 50% grants, whether they're federal, uh, local philanthropic grants, or dollars uh, from the state health department that come directly from the state or flow through from the federal government. We have seen an impact from the sequester, particularly in our preparedness dollars, about an 8% cut uh, that's affected um, uh, service delivery and, and some of those dollars then expand out across the five counties that uh, we described. Um, in terms of outcomes, we've been very successful at eliminating, uh, reducing lead poisoning problems, which as we know, lead is, has everything to do with cognition, retention, uh, school performance, interface with the juvenile justice system, uh, aggression, um, and we've reduced uh, lead poisoning rates by 80% uh, since 2000, something we're very proud of. Uh, we have over a 98% compliance rate on the Smoke-Free Workplaces Act and have seen a 28% reduction in chief complaints for emergency department visits for heart attacks uh, since the ban was instituted, which is a major savings um, across the board for treatment, also um, uh, savings for uh, um, uh, down the road in terms of uh, cost to the system. We screen about 2,000 women annually in our breast and cervical cancer grant. Uh, we distribute fish meal baits uh, throughout the county annually to reduce uh, the possibility of movement of raccoon rabies coming in from Lake County, which is a threat that we've seen for a number of years, distributing those uh, throughout the county. Um, respond to about 2,000 communicable diseases and, and outbreaks annually as well. Um, we do quite a bit now around health and, and wellness, uh, farm to school initiatives, working with school systems to uh, bring fresh fruits and vegetables and build them into the school system, reduce competitive foods uh, uh, that uh, are brought in often fast food that are brought in to compete with uh, uh, healthy choices, uh, working with uh, community gardening opportunities and a range of communities, uh, pushing walking programs. And by the way, the single uh, easiest thing uh, from a public health message you can do uh, to reduce your chronic disease risk in half, according to Kaiser and building evidence is to walk 30 minutes a day, every day. Easy to do, easy message in the community. Uh, Lastly, I'll mention uh, the uh, well, second last year, I'll mention our health improvement uh, partnership program. We're working with uh, 50 agencies in the community uh, as well as county health and human services uh, to build a comprehensive first of its kind countywide health improvement plan. Uh, and and uh, in the process, uh, we've uh, been doing extensive community engagement. Uh, we uh, did a community health status assessment uh, that includes 55 health indicators across a, a, a range of domains that's available for view and use by lots of people at hipcuyahoga.org. Uh, we uh, surveyed 7,000 residents countywide uh, to ask them what their health priorities were. And as they emerged, the health priorities that were universal across Cleveland uh, countywide, there were about uh, four or five priorities that, that were consistent across those 7,000 people surveyed. They included alcohol, drug abuse concerns. They were concerned about obesity and the rise in obesity. They were concerned uh, about safety in neighborhoods and violence and uh, uh, mental health. Those were the issues that arose across all 7,000 citizens, independent of whether you were in the Cleveland East or West. Uh, there were some differences in certain uh, communities. Um, Cleveland East, we heard about unhealthy neighborhoods. That's an issue about the neighborhood context and is a, is a big important piece of what we're doing in our health improvement planning process trying to link clinical and public health services to really focus on chronic disease, to think about healthy eating and active living, and lastly, to deal with this issue around race and social determinants. We know that across the board, that outcomes for minorities in, in across the country are far poorer on a range of chronic diseases, um, um, and we want to concentrate that to address that in our health improvement planning process. Going forward, we expect the sequester will offer a number of challenges to us, um, certainly uh, cuts in the federal, uh, federal funds that may result from changes in the Affordable Care Act and, and that will affect service delivery, dealing with the rising costs of chronic disease. And I will tell you that right now, the United Health Agencies predicts that by 2020, that half the country will be diabetic or pre-diabetic at a cost of three and a half trillion in the next 10 years. That's the prediction, and that's not sustainable. 
dealing with the inequities and the gaps that relate to both race and class is a, is a consistent issue. One hallmark that we're seeing now is infant mortality. Ohio has the highest infant mortality rate in the country, state among the states. And uh, we know that the black-white infant mortality gap is it's three times higher among black infants. And so that's a statewide priority uh, that we, uh, along with eight other urban areas, are working to address. And we're also working toward national public health accreditation, um, uh, which is a new um, mandate. And the state of Ohio is the only state in the union to mandate national public health accreditation uh, and by 2018 for all local health departments. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you for the chance to uh, provide an overview, and I'd be happy to provide uh, answers to any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much. Questions for the uh, Director of Health, Councilman Rogers, followed by Sean. Thank you, um, thank you for the presentation. I just had one question for clarity under the um, solid waste management funding. Mm -hmm. You have listed here it's the 185,000 comes from planning. Right. Um, that, that, doesn't that money come from the solid waste? Should be district? the solid waste yeah. planning district. It's correct. Yes. Right. Thank you, right. Councilman Tron. Thank you, uh, Mr. Allen. You're, uh, I think, the third presentation we heard today, and mm -hmm. all three relate back to uh, something that uh, Councilman Brady and Simon uh, brought up and which I uh, am in agreement with, uh, which was the conversation about interlocking and relationships out there. You, you brought up schools, you brought up education, so did all, both the other ones. Early intervention brought in the concepts of, uh, of its importance of, of food and dietetics and, and good health, eating as we heard its effect on uh, the, the developmental disabilities uh, impacts and uh, and, the, and the Adams Board, who is coordinating those so that, because uh, we also have heard transportation is an expensive component of this and it's always a problem. Uh, obviously, if we're making three trips, and we've only heard three just today, to present messages, is there anyone coordinating these things to get an efficiency of government uh, out of uh, the way in which we're bringing that message? It's going to the same recipient. It's going with, I assume, some similar concepts uh, there, but it's being delivered by multiple different sources. Uh, and what, where's the coordination? I think, he, uh, I think Mr. Gallagher also was bringing up that. So you can hear a common theme going on here. Uh, do you sit down with these other, mm -hmm. uh, these other groups, even though, uh, and, and actually say, we're doing this on the third. We're going to, to Oliver Hazard Perry Elementary School on such and such a date. What can we do to coordinate so we're, you're not going there two weeks later and some so right so we're, I think we're I, talking budgets here that's that's my that's what I'm looking at as far as the financials right. aspects right. I think that from a coordination standpoint coordination could undoubtedly be better I think a good example of the coordination that happens through the Office of Health and Human S Services around uh, early childhood is a great example of coordination across systems and, and that's something that we're very much linked to I think the coordination that's occurred around the opiate epidemic has been extensive and, and, and very important because there's a range of providers uh, out there delivering services with different levels of expertise and a huge problem that uh, 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 from appearances continues to grow. I would say that we could do a better job uh, because of the range of services are often driven um, obviously by the funders and often the funding is very categorical and we've, we've tried even from the federal level to suggest that from the Centers for Disease Control where a lot of our money flows that they allow us to begin to, to uh, uh, address multiple objectives, uh, but often the categorical nature of the funding and the deliverables that are pro were to meet often prevent us from, from, um, from the level of coordination that would be uh, effective. But without question, I think your point is well taken. Uh, there may be places and opportunities for us to coordinate uh, depending on the issue, and there are myriad issues. Uh, that may and, and the compounding disadvantages that many of our uh, uh, families are facing. And I think depending on the issue, whether it's healthy eating and active living, that is essentially a group of people that are working on healthy eating and active living issues. If it's an issue around education or transportation, uh, that may be a separate uh, uh, group of people that are looking to address that specifically. So from an issue by issue basis, there are some of it, but not to the degree that it should be without question, Councilman. 
you, 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 the education was just an example because the right. heroin is, is, is right. a common thread that's running through this. And I, I was afraid you were going to tell me that, that was your answer. It was part of the part of the, the problem is that the funding sources are dictating the multiple deliveries and the inconsistencies or the the lack of consolidation, uh, which is kind of a shame mm -hmm. because ultimately the taxpayer is paying for it, whether it's coming through a federal source, state source, a county source. Right. It's all it's all a, a taxpayer driven. Uh, and maybe we could actually be a beacon of something different here in the county where we try to, to, to unify, not necessarily to tell the funding source, but to actually be a, uh, be a, a clearinghouse to help, help coordinate that. Because it, from a business standpoint, you deliver a less efficient service when three or four or five people yeah. are delivering the, or trying to deliver the same service out there as opposed to picking best in breed and you, you choose that to be the one to deliver this service and so on and so forth. So, I agree. Um, I, I, I anticipate you're going to tell me the funding uh, uh, was driving process, which is kind of sad uh, because ultimately there's still only one, there's only one need, whoever that and, and uh, need is out there in the system. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to pile on a little bit. Uh, I, I totally agree with the coordination concern. And my question is, how much coordination on the Healthy Citizens Program do you have with the same, similar program that's being run by the city of Cleveland? Uh, we are, our, our staff, a our, uh, number of our staff are actually on those committees. Uh, we've realized because uh, we're working in very closely with the city of Cleveland Department of Public Health and Shaker Heights Health Department on our health improvement plan. Our folks are participating on their work. Uh, we're also tied very closely to the health alliance work that the county executive uh, is moving forward. We see a lot of those uh, issues, concerns merging. They're similar across the community and that we want to be effective in, in assuring that uh, there is a good use of resources because we also hear from the range of committee members that they can only go to so many committee meetings and why not try and, and be more effective in the way that we coordinate the planning process. So we see that as essential. There are some components that may be unique based on the demands of the, um, of the administration in, in, in one uh, area or another. But we do see that there's a lot of overlap. The problems are, health problems are similar and they're known, uh, the public health problems. So, uh, it certainly is our intent as our process goes forward and we're getting toward a goal development that we would overlap with the work that the city of Cleveland is doing and, and incorporate the, continue to incorporate the work of the Health Alliance, which we participate in uh, very extensively. Okay. Other questions for the Health Department? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. The... Uh, Next item on our schedule is that uh, that the administration uh, has reviewed the health and human services budget in line of in light of the passage of the uh, HHS levy and and uh, and and we have a sheet that has been distributed uh, a list of proposed changes and I would like to call forward. Director Merriman to uh, give us, to go through this with us, give us a little bit of their philosophy and, and, uh, and what we have here. Good morning. David Merriman, Deputy Chief of Staff for Human Services. Uh, before you today is the administration's amendment of the biennium budget. And uh, I know that that budget is currently being reviewed at this time, so this amendment includes changes that respond to the new levy resources. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through with the document that's been presented and um, I briefly review new programs and also discuss next points in the process from, from our perspective. So uh, fr from the top of the document, I think the first area that you'll see is that the administration has restored all of the funding cuts that were, were required to present a balanced budget. And uh, these are uh, ranging r really from, from poison control and IT personnel all the way through children and family services, employment and family services, child support, senior services, and, and then other specific programs. 
You've got the list in front of you, so I. <clears throat> That's the one. Yes. Right. The one that on the top line says 2014 to 15 recommended budget, and underneath it says sum summary proposed amendments, county executive. Yes, Mr. Chairman. It would, it would be a dated document. Okay, it's uh, okay. requested the documents be dated in the future. Then. Okay. Make another one too. Makes sense. Uh, so, uh, w without going into each of the areas that we've restored, we have uh, we were required to make cu cuts throughout our budgets to present a balanced budget, and, uh, and essentially we are returning to the base budget that was initially developed with the departments. Uh, those cuts account for accounted for essentially $4.8 million in reductions in 14 and $10 million in reductions in 2015. They also required us to use a greater proportion of PA funds, public assistance funds, as, uh, as well as some additional levy uh, reserves that we had. Can I ask a question, Mr. Chair, on that sure. point? Um, so I just want to be clear, these, were these items exactly as what was reduced before because I see some discrepancies in, in, in a couple of the dollar amounts. So is this just, uh, from your perspective, was this actually putting everything back in the way it was or there's still, I've identified a few, there were still some changes made to that? We, we have maintained, I'm sorry, uh, to the councilwoman through the chair, we have maintained a few of the transfers that occurred, uh, specifically, there, there was a, uh, an item on the budget that we included that was transferring $380,000 out of the Health and Human Service levy to pay for the scholarships that council appropriated. Those, those funds would more appropriately be, I'm sorry, those services would more appropriately be funded out of the general fund. I think that was the intention of it, and so that in, in, a, in a way is a correction. There have also been areas in uh, juvenile court spending that we've shifted either onto the general fund or feel that those some of the services can be uh, funded out of 4E funds. And director, the uh, the OSU extension subsidy, did you maintain that in the general fund as as proposed? Uh, actually, we we restored that back to the human service levy. Okay, back to the HHS. Okay. Uh, so uh, moving on, the, the next area that you will see is, is new programs that have been proposed by the administration, and uh, I'd be happy to go through each of those uh, if, 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 that, uh, if that's acceptable. Please do. <clears throat> so from the top, the first program that you'll see is increased contractual capacity for jail reentry activities. I've been in a series of conversations with the Sheriff Frank Bova, as well as Ken Kochevar. Uh, as all of you know, the reentry office is located in the Department of Health and Human Services, but much of its focus is on reentry re and recidivism from state institutions. And I think there's a sense that in the county, we have to do more with our own services. Now, our office of reentry has been shifting much of its attention to the jail already. But we see that there, there is more opportunity to be had. If we can support people to return to their communities from the county jail and to address whatever conditions cause them to spend time in the jail, that uh, it's, a, it's an improvement in their lives, the lives of their family, the community, as well as a potential cost saver to the county. I know that staffing may be changing in the jail, and we'd like to work with them to create programs that will support greater reentry and uh, and address some of the cycles of recidivism. Mr. Chair. Uh, Just, if I can, on, 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 on this point, I also would, would ask that on the, the restoring funding, I, I'd like to hear, hear the rationale why they decided to remove it and now replace it, because obviously they weren't a priority then, but they appear to maybe be so now. But on this one, we're talk, you're talking about creating a whole new reentry protocol for county, county jail I don't, what are they called, releasees? You know, those being released from the county jail, correct? 
No, that's not correct. What we're talking about is looking at the existing services and, and assessing which of them are uh, sufficiently meeting the needs of, of individuals returning to their community and understanding if we can, in fact, improve the process by which uh, individuals return to their community from the jail. From the county jail? From the county jail. Is that different than the current reentry program? Much of the current reentry program focuses on individuals returning to Cuyahoga County from state institutions. Right. So we'll, so we'll continue much of that focus, but we, we, we also want to expand our focus on county jail. Okay. That, yeah, that, maybe I didn't ask my original question correctly. So this is a new program basically taking the existing protocol that the reentry folks focus on with non-county releases to county releases is that correct it, it's it's presented on this on this uh, on this sheet as a new program because it's a new spending area but it's it's not a new program in the jail the jail has a long history of providing reentry services there they've gotten grants in the past second chance grant grants and uh, they have some county funding currently to support reentry services much of it targeting women that are returning but it, it, it is insufficiently funded, and we, we believe that we can do more in addressing the recidivism that many of these individuals experience. Jim? Can, can, we, uh, can we go through the whole list and, and then open for questions? No. Right. Okay, please proceed. Sure. Uh, the, the next item on the list is uh, universal pre-kindergarten. We, we understand that this is a priority of this community and we are expanding capacity in UPK. Uh, we've heard time and again that this is a valued service and uh, believe that we should in fact be investing more in it. And so this is uh, a million dollar increase in universal pre-kindergarten. The next area <clears throat> is the addition of uh, slots in early childhood mental health programming. Uh, as you all, as all of you may be aware, we have an early childhood mental health program. Uh, it's an effective program. It's up and running. We have been so effective, we've actually created a backlog. And so there are children in this community that have early childhood mental health problems that are not being seen. And uh, the system does work to try to have all children that are Medicaid eligible uh, support their services through Medicaid, but we understand some children are not, or there's at times gaps in services. So this uh, increase responds to the existing wait list that exists for early childhood mental health. Moving on, the opiate task force and the Naxalone, I hope I got that right, program that this, uh, this county started earlier uh, w was begun as, as a one-time investment. This is, this is the use of a drug to support people that are, um, are, are trying to address their heroin uh, addiction. And what we are proposing is that we make this an ongoing expense and that we continue to provide resources to address the opiate epidemic that is currently hitting this county. The next area is uh, a, a new program. There is a existing independent living program in the Division of Children and Family Services. They do in fact already support children, I'm sorry, they do already in, uh, support the, the youth that are in the custody of the Division of Children and Family Services, an independent living program to do college visits. But we've heard in the community that there are times uh, other, other services that are needed. And what we want to do is we want to look at facilitating our children, these are children in county custody, to spend time on college campuses, to become familiarized with life on college campuses, and we're gonna look for programs to accomplish that. Uh, I think the Division of Children and Family Services has done a great job at, at supporting children to graduate. Our, our graduation rates in, in DCFS are, I believe, at all-time highs, and, and we know that many of those, those young adults go to college but not all of them are ready for it. And I think as many of us understand, children go to college, there, there's a, at times a cultural shock, there's, there's other issues that sometimes re result in them leaving college before they're done. And we believe that if we can begin to create experiences for them on college campuses that will f enable them to stay and become comfortable in that environment, we can see more of those young adults graduate. <clears throat> Moving on. So there is a, a, a mental health coordinator program currently at the Division of Children and Family Services. It's a part-time. We, we pay for a portion of that position. Uh, this, is, uh, this is needed to address the referral of, of youth to 
early childhood mental health services and mental health services in general. And it's the recommendation that that position become a full-time position so that we can have greater facilitation of clients to behavioral health services. Uh, that, that program is actually similar to a program that exists in the county jail. D the Division of Children and Family Services has a coordinator that is housed in the county jail to help facilitate DCFS families that are in jail, where their parents are in jail. And we, we want to ensure that those families are aware of what's going on in their cases. This is the jail. What we are now proposing is a similar position be existed within the homeless service system. We, we realize that there is not enough coordination between the Division of Children and Family Services and the homeless system. As, as we've looked at how those systems interact, we see that th there, is, there is clear communication at the direct service level and an effort to coordinate services, but it, it is not, th that coordination is not existing at the highest level, at system to system. There, there's absolutely opportunities for us to improve the quality of services that families are experiencing and hopefully address custody. I think the Division of Children and Family Services has taken a strong position. We don't take custody because a person's homeless. It's not a reason for us to take custody. But the reasons that a person ends up homeless is frequently also the reason that they get involved with DCFS. And so we have to be more coordinated and we have to facilitate better interagency case planning. <laughs> also from the Division of Children and Family Services, is the expansion of the uh, multi-system therapy or MST, Problem Sexual Behavior uh, Adaptation Program. This is a program that many of you, you have seen at the Board of Control level. The Juvenile Court currently provides this program. Uh, it's targeted to youth that have, um, as it says, sexual behavior problems. Uh, this is a, a, a very challenging group of, of clients to serve. There are, in fact, evidence-based interventions, and MST is an evidence-based intervention that uh, can be used to treat youth with problem sexual behavior. And so uh, DCFS has proposed expanding their services in the same way that the juvenile court has. Frequently, these are the same families, and sometimes the, the, the young adults will actually transition from juvenile court involvement to the county involvement. And I think this program will allow us to continue services as, as, uh, as youth transition between those systems. <clears throat> uh, the next area is uh, also from the Division of Children and Family Services. And uh, so what we, are, what, we are, what we would like to accomplish is to renew our effort, effort to increase foster parent recruitment. Uh, I think as you're all aware, there are two ways for families in Cuyahoga County to become foster parents. You can become a county foster parent where we manage those resources, or you can become a network foster parent where you go to a nonprofit and you become licensed through them. Uh, you know, I think there are advantages and disadvantages to both. I'd point out one advantage to the county in terms of increasing our foster parent uh, resources and the number of foster parents that are licensed through us, is these are usually the lowest cost resources, and they're also the resources that are closest to the community. They're, they're families that live in Cuyahoga County, and as all of you have heard from Pat right out, our goal is to keep children in their community whenever possible. And so if we have more foster parents in our community, then we can keep children in their community. And so we would like to uh, reemphasize how important it is for us to have foster children and in their community, and as a result, the need to have foster parents throughout Calca County. So the next, uh, the next section, before I, I get into the description, I'd like to call out that these are, in fact, uh, proposals that we would be using the PA fund to support. And uh, our, our, our hope is that we will be using the PA fund for more one-time or time-limited expenditures. And um, the first on that list is a proposal to increase staffing at Job and Family Services to respond to recent changes in Medicaid expansion. We don't see this as, as necessarily a long-term need, but potentially a need for a surge in staffing. 
And so what we're proposing is to increase staffing through the use of the PA fund in 2014, but then to back off some of that staffing level in the 2015 and hopefully return to previous staffing levels for 2016. The, the goal of, of Medicaid expansion is to have as much of the work become automated. And you know, I, I don't want to really get into the discussion of how well functioning the existing websites and application processes are, but I think there is, an, there is an understanding that the state is working on its own Medicaid application process. There will be other efforts to combine existing state systems into that, and uh, this is great because many of the state systems, or at least the primary one, is written in COBOL. Uh, it's a very Ooh, inefficient wow. and very difficult to use system, and I think over time we hope that better IT resources at the state level will lead to more efficiency at the county level. So we don't necessarily believe there needs to be a long-term commitment to staff, but we also know, as, as Administrator Gonder reported, there will be double data entry as well as additional assessments needed in the, in the coming year. So uh, we, we're proposing an increase in staffing during that time. We hope that the staffing won't be necessary permanently and that we can manage this surge through attrition. Uh, I'm going to just talk about this next, this last group of changes. Uh, well, so no, let me do one more, and then I'll, I'll talk about the IT changes together. Director Rideout um, requested additional uh, hardware and software upgrades in uh, in the Division of Children and Family Services. These are capital expenditures. They're they're not significant, but they they were lost in the uh, in in the budget reduction process, and so we, we feel that those are capital expenses, and we would return them to her budget. Uh, I think that's also an important uh, opportunity for morale as we improve our, our work environment. And then the, the last group, the, the final items that are listed there, there are three hardware and software upgrades by information technology. Uh, so one of the things that we, we did, one of the ways in which we developed these proposed amendments is to look not just at human service spending, but a look across budgets. One of the, the areas that there is significant human service spending is in IT upgrades. Uh, as I just described with the Cobalt system, there are many other antiquated IT systems. Uh, Director Mowry has been assessing these for some time, and he's presented in part of his budget a series of upgrades. Those were reviewed by this, by, by this council. And so you've already looked at these upgrades. And my, to my knowledge, those are expenses that would uh, be charged to his budget. Now, there, there may have been some expectation for chargeback. However, they're not on our budget. And what we're, what we're proposing is that we have those IT upgrades provided out of the public assistance fund so that we can do greater federal, federal reimbursement. If, if we are making capital investments and we are using human service dollars, we should be able to get a higher level of federal reimbursement back, or at least some level of federal reimbursement. So we're, we're proposing to shift those expenses onto the human service budget and open ourselves up for an opportunity of federal reimbursement. So that's the list in front of you. Uh, I would also say that we have uh, restored all of the cuts as tw in 2016. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that on here you see very few proposed uh, uh, program additions for the Division of Senior and Adult Services. We, we did speak with uh, Administrator Tracy Mason. She's in the middle of a strategic planning process and, and she communicated that she, she knows she will have program needs. I think it's clear that she will, and, and we've had some early discussions about them, but they're not finalized yet. And, in, and so we're, we're gonna wait to see her finalize her strategic planning process so that she has a clear understanding of what exactly needs uh, exist within her department, and then she's gonna bring them forward to us to consider. Uh, similarly, but not, not quite at the same point, Director Rideout, or Administrator Rideout, is, is, is still finalizing her strategic planning process. She's just about done. She's just about to start rolling it out but I anticipate that her process will also identify other opportunities. And, uh, and I know that she, she works very tirelessly on, 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 on looking for major system changes and has a few suggestions about those, but I don't know that those ideas are ready at this time. Okay, we're gonna start to my right with Councilman Greenspan and work our way down, because I think probably most of us will have questions. Okay, fine, uh, Council President. You know, Mr. Merriman, I appreciate the work that the administration has gotten get put into this, but I just got this 20 minutes ago, 
And I just don't think it's fair for you to come in with these major, major changes. Um, just in the cursory review that I've had an opportunity to do while I'm listening to you, there are a number of um, new positions. Um, there are a number of um, programs that, you know, there, we already have existing programs and you're changing. So I, I, I'm really at a loss to start. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time, you know, asking very specific questions until I have an opportunity to review this. And one of the things that jumps out to me is you have this new program about adoption services outreach, and there's no one, you know, that's more concerned about adoption than I am because I have an adopted child. Um, you did this a few years ago. You spent $300,000 and you didn't get one child adopted. So now you're going to go out and hire some media people to put out billboards and stuff. You did this before and it didn't work. Um, you know, you're hiring, you got a new position of a homeless coordinator. We already have people doing that. You got a new coordinator for um, um, this implementation of um, mental health. We got the analyst board doing that. Um, you know, there's nobody more concerned about sending kids to college, but I don't know. I just, th this is a big program, and I just think it's unfair to give us this, and we, we got to spend some time looking at it. Uh, I would just say that, uh, that I did not uh, intend for there to be a major discussion of this at this time, but I... I uh, Figures, and but, then you say, well, any questions? And I you, go, well, you, I got questions. You, you know, uh, we mostly wanted to have this in front of us for context for our discussion of the agencies. I don't understand what you mean context. You give us this, you say this is what you want to spend, and now it's, well, you know, what, this is what you gave us. It is what it is. You, you know, I was, uh, I was afraid that, uh, that we wouldn't get this... Uh, Till after today, after the hearings had been completed, and, and you know, I'm, I'm just happy to have it. So, so, but uh, we'll, we'll, it, we'll just, we, it, it, it's a tightly constrained process. The levy just passed. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have this on the table. So we'll, we'll make it work, uh, Councilman Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I guess I was anticipating, you know, some of this because of the of the passage of the levy, f for sure. Um, uh, I knew that there would be some restorations and cuts. I didn't anticipate um, for there to be as much restoration and cuts as has been had been proposed in the first place. <clears throat> um, the um, I'm also glad to see to see this, um, uh, um, and so I'll just I'll just leave it at that rather than do the usual complaint about why why I didn't see it any sooner, um, because this has been a fast moving um, situation uh, that's been only about ten days since um, the levy passed, uh, um, and so I can imagine that that. Um, there's been a lot of scrambling going on um, in terms of the budget. Um, I um, do see items here that I'm not sure, and I'm trying to also be mindful of what the chairman is saying, but it's, it is difficult to respond to, uh, you know, $26 million, um, counting the restored cuts uh, approximately, um, uh, without anything to say about it, except it's we should be aware of it. Um, these are proposals. Uh, these are proposals. The council acts on on proposals, and uh, so I see these as quite fascinating, um, and um, uh, but simply as being proposed to this council. Um, uh, we have uh, a, about. I'm doing the best I can here. About $11 million in <clears throat> new spending. Um, um, I have will take would have to would have to have some time to be able to absorb that, but it would be uh, good to have it 
in mind um, as we get a chance to listen to the presentation of the of the other um, of the agencies. Um, I'm not sure all of this should come out of any particular uh, uh, fund. Uh, I don't know when we have this discussion exactly. Uh, I, I do um, am fascinated or interested in the fact that um, uh, the administration is uh, contemplating spending down on, on, P on PA funds uh, as they were in the, in the, in the proposal that came in uh, before this one. Um, and um, I just want to, um, without, and really, I'll try to really be as short as I can, um, uh, expand this conversation, not, not because I'm out here to spend a bunch of money, but just so we have some context. Um, we have about, from what I understand, and I could certainly be off, but probably by not that much. Um, we have about uh, $32 million in the PA fund. Um, I think the discussion about what the PA fund is, the history of it, what it's for, and everything like that is probably going to have to be part of this discussion. Um, we have about $10 million uh, in the HH fund above the reserve level of 10%. Uh, and don't get me wrong, because I'm not r r saying suggesting anything. Uh, we have about 20 million. These are not these are not these are these are not bad things. Mm -hmm. We have about 20 million uh, uh, in the general fund above the reserve level of 25 percent, which is one of the highest reserve levels I've ever heard of. I haven't found anybody who can show me one that high anywhere yet. But this is 20 million above that. Um, again, not a bad thing. Uh, from what I understand, uh, we have about, uh, and there I've heard some differences on this, but ab about seven to eight million new dollars above um, what we were, what we would have had um, uh, without the reductions in the property evaluations uh, through the through the levy. Uh, we may have, and there's some conversation about how to measure that. We may have around six million dollars in 15 in sales taxes from the Medicaid uh, waiver. Um, there, I may have missed something. Uh, there sounds like something around 75 million dollars. Um, I'm not suggesting that we should spend 75 million dollars or anything near that, but I think it's important uh, to. If we're going to have an expanded conversation, which, which apparently we are, if we're going to have an expanded conversation, that we have some sense of, um, of where that money is. Mm -hmm. And that's not you know, counting the reserves themselves, which I'm, again, not suggesting that we would want to touch, mm -hmm. but we're, are somewhere in the, in, the, in, the, in the area of 100 million, I believe, in the general fund. And, um, I'm not quite sure, 20 to 20, 20 plus in the Health and Human Service 10% fund um, for a total of close to $200 million. They, and, and a lot of it is in absolutely necessary reserves. Uh, but um, we're having an expanded conversation here and um, where the money comes from and what this council intends to do or not do uh, is really, you know, uh, been opened up, wide opened up by, by these, um, by this, by these uh, suggestions uh, for new programs. So um, I welcome that discussion, but it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty dramatic uh, discussion. And um, that's all I have to say at this time, Mr. Chairman. Councilman Germana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just wondering on the, uh, Mr. Merriman, on, on, on the bottom of these IT items, you're, you're suggesting they come out of the PA fund. Uh, were these in the IT budget, so we're just taking them out of the PA fund and decreasing the IT budget? Uh, to the councilman, through the chair, these were in the IT budget, and okay, we're so suggesting that they come out of the PA fund. So then, the, uh, at least... We got uh, 
over three million that are, it is just a transfer. It's not an increase. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, Councilman Tron. And I just want to make be real clear that the items we were just talking about, these five items that are uh, coming out of the PA fund recommendation, are are one-time transactions which will be over within two years, based on the way it's <clears throat> been budgeted, with the expectation that they will sunset at the end of that two-year period is what you're presenting to this council right now. To the there council, will be no residual continuing into 2016, 2017. That that. At least that's what I thought I heard. To the councilman through the chair, that's, that is the intent of presenting them in this way. We understand that as uh, major systems are implemented in the community, that uh, sometimes they don't go as planned, but we hope that there, they will be implemented effectively, that there will be new IT resources available to workers and to the community to complete much of the work that is currently done in a, a very inefficient manner it's the, the state of the IT systems are not are not very effective and so if if the specific uh, concern is around the EFS specialists we we would like to see our EFS FTE count go back in 2016 to what it is now and um, but we understand there's more work to be done between now and then as as to the IT upgrades uh, we, we understand there's an initial cost to implement some of those systems. There could be a maintenance cost if it's a new system moving forward, but the, the major purchase should be seen as a one-time purchase that is, is best suited for PA funds. And this was all forecasted by uh, Mr. Maori as far as this, uh, the one-time aspects of it that will sunset in two years as far as the implementation. These IT systems were included in Mr. Mowry's budget. He tracked them. He considered that they were strategic purchases that should be made. They were a part of the budget that was presented to you, and, and so they were included in that work list. I'm talking about the reference to the sunsetting uh, as far as this, because there's, there's some rumor that there's sometimes software doesn't get started on time it on budget and then be effective. I've heard a rumor about that. I don't know if that, mm -hmm. there's any truth to that one. And I would hate to see us going down a path, uh, because it's really hard for me to believe uh, that you're going to see. Uh, I would love to hear that from Mr. Maori that mm -hmm. he believes that. Not, not, not that I don't dis, dis, uh, disbelieve what you, your enthusiasm for that, but software doesn't have a has a tendency to grow as far as its expense. Councilman, I agree with you, and and I have transferred over his costs and his projects. I, I, I see them as his his responsibility to see these purchased on the timeline he's presented and implemented in the way that he he has uh, demonstrated that he can. And your reasons for putting it into the PA fund for funding is that you believe that, that there will be a higher amount of matching funds potentially that could, get, could be coming out of other funding sources if it comes out, if it follows that track versus coming out through the general fund. Uh, yes. So unfortunately, uh, Director Mowry is not, a, not available at this time. And I understand that these funds were included in his budget. Right. And if they are in a human service budget, we should be able to get federal 4D for e, federal for reimbursement. I might have the, the wrong letter there. But there should be federal reimbursement for human service expenses in, in this way. Okay. And just, it, it's, it's very interesting. Just by recategorizing it on our, on our financial statement, it, it then becomes a qualified as opposed to, as we're talking about, just moving the dollars from... For, dollars are usually fungible, and but somehow we're, we're it's going to qualify for for reimbursement. I, I would love to hear both the sunset portion and why that is uh, is is applicable on that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Conwell. Uh, through the chair to uh, Deputy Chief Merriman. Um, I'm like my colleagues, why are we finally hearing about these new programs? Uh, many of them are uh, HHS on, and I guess would fall in public safety uh, committee. I mean, it's just hard for me to believe that you guys all year have not known that you were going to implement these programs or had some idea that you were going to have these programs. So we're part time. You guys are full time. We have committee days set, and I think that as you were discussing these and having these creations of these new programs, they should have been introduced to the committee chairs. So it could have been heard out, vetted out, instead of just 
presented to us in this way. Now, we know these new programs, all of us know that they wouldn't have been presented if the Health and Human Service levy hadn't passed. Um, we're, we're all very clear with that. So in moving forward, we can't keep griping about what you know, has been presented to us before, but you guys sit down and have discussions about new programs that are probably great and we, we'd agree on. We don't, we don't have any problem about that, but going forward on the short time that we have, many of, the, many of the, my colleagues have dual obligations. So we need to hear the, of this stuff going forward as it's being discussed. And I, I've heard council presidents say it over and over and over, it's like a broken record, um, that that's the relationship we wanna have instead of just present it to smack it in our face. Um, now, and it's also a disrespect to the uh, to your directors. You know, we have, we spent time. You've, time is money. You've taken up our time to go over the budget that you presented with us. Now we have new facts, which are going to take additional time. Out of I, so, I, I'm really upset. So, in moving forward, I kind of have an A B C plan in my life, and I think you guys should have an A B C plan. We're gonna do the cuts. We understood why you were gonna do the cuts because the levy wasn't formulated. You should also had a plan if the levy had passed because it, it kind of showed that maybe you didn't have faith that we were gonna pass the plan. So in the future, that's what I have to say about all that. And then on some of these, the restore funding doesn't exactly match up on some of these. So in my recommendations, I'm gonna make sure that the dollar amounts um, they've been juggled around in the Family and Children First Council. I want to make sure that they match up with what was presented in the budget. That's all I have to say. Uh, Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess my question is around staffing levels. And, and I guess because it's Thursday. And what I mean by that is earlier this morning I was doing payroll. So unless you've done payroll and felt the stress of making sure you could meet it every week, you, know, you really don't think about it. Uh, I'm sure most people don't think about that. But just meeting that payroll on a weekly basis is, is always, um, it's always on your mind. You know? and, and I say that because um, over the, these last three years, the administration has, has clearly put forward a, a, a policy of maintaining staffing levels. And, I think this council collectively have, has had concern, particularly in some of these, uh, in some departments such as uh, DCFS and, and EFS, caseworkers and, uh, and social workers, and uh, it's concurrent concerns I've, I've heard over the last few years. Uh, as I look at this expanded programming, how has that, how has the programming that you've put forward suggested changed that staffing level? Uh, to, the, to the councilman, through the chair, I, I think two of the important things that you're seeing here, one are uh, investments in coordinator positions. I, I, I understand that workers are so busy managing the actual requirements of their cases that at times they lack the ability to get above their system and see what other resources exist in the community. I can give an example. There, there's great resources in our community for, for families that are going into the homeless system that can be diverted, that can be able to stay in their home with additional resources. And our goal is to not have them get to the homeless system because it's better for them to stay in their house. Some workers may use those resources and some may not be aware of them. So I think if we can provide more system to system coordination, if we could begin to think from a systems perspective we are able to support workers to be more efficient and effective. And, and I think it's, it's they're smaller investments in, in comparison to uh, dramatic increases in direct services. But if they, if they can provide direct service workers with more resources, then those workers can be more effective. And I think that's, I think that's an effective model. It's worked here in the jail. I think it's worked well enough in early ch in, in the mental health component of DCFS that we've created a backlog and needed additional resources. So we could see this can continue. And with the Affordable Care Act coming forward, I think there will be even more mental health resources available to the community. And we want to make sure our, our systems are communicating effectively. 
Well, and I, and I hear you, and I understand your, your point. Uh, I see $10 million and staff, restored staff at $4 million, uh, services at $4 million, an additional six and expanded. And unless I'm missing a count, I actually could only say you're going to raise staffing levels by one person. Coordination. Did I miss someone? The homeless service coordinator. Is that fair to say? No. Well, there there, there are a few increases in in this list beyond that, especially in job and family services. The twenty uh, additional temporary. Yeah. To deal with the, the the coming change, but then returning back to the original staffing levels. And and to to be very clear, we've not. You know, the, the administration is not trying to spend out all the levy because the dollars are there. And, you know, we've worked with council throughout this past biennium to present other areas for for additional investment. And, and I, you know, I, I think we all expect that to continue. We don't have a, a, an immediate sense right now of every need. But I think moving forward, as we identify new needs, we'll, we'll, we'll bring them forward. And uh, so th there could be additional expense in the future. Well, one thing I've learned is that this is a partnership between yeah. the administration and the council. And if we put it there and you don't want to spend it, you're not going to spend it. So 2014, we have certain levels. And philosophically, I'm thinking now, as we partner in 2014, we, we may have a little more flexibility in 2015. Uh, so I'll, I will be thinking along those lines as we look at the suggested budget. Great, thank you. I just have some questions on um, some specifics, just so I'm clear on this page. Um, under the homeless services for restoring funding, you have um, 100,000 for homeless center support and then funding for North Plain at 1.2 million. But I see on the, on the um, 2014 line, you only have the 100,000. Uh, to the councilman through the chair, the the intention was to uh, to cut funding for North Point in 2015 only. We would we would maintain the county's appropriation for that in 2014, but to look at that issue in 2015. So there was not a proposed cut for 2014. Uh, ah, okay. Um, the additional slots for I'm sorry. Additional slots for the early childhood mental health program. Is the $250,000 each year get rid of the backlog, or is there still backlog with $250,000? Uh, to the councilman through the chair, the, the value of $250,000 was, was provided to me by Invest in Children. And I think they came up with that value by looking at how many children were on the wait list at a point in time. And I think at the point in time, it was 41. Mm -hmm. And until so I think they annualized that and thought this is the value of the, the needed resources to, to clear the weight, the backlog, and get those children the treatment they need. Okay. Um, the sexual behavior adaptation, can you clarify, you had said that the juvenile court provides those services, and then for some reason they leave juven juvenile court and then are come on to the county? Can you kind of clear so, that up? Yeah, to the councilman, through the chair. Juvenile court provides MST uh, problem sexual behavior services right now. That is that is a contract that's been before the Board of Control on many occasions. Mm -hmm. As as you may be aware, the juvenile court uh, will, will at times terminate their involvement with a child, but uh, provide custody to the county for us to continue to meet their needs. Uh, technically, I believe these are referred to as dependency cases. Mm -hmm. They feel the family is not in a position to have that child go home. And so they'll give them to the county and say, this is now your responsibility. And so this is like a continuation of care? I, I believe it's a, a portion of that. I, I do think there are, there are times when transition occurs that we want to make sure that services occur as well. These could also be for children that have not come into custody, and, um, or, or they could be children that were never involved with juvenile court but have problem sexual behaviors. Okay. And then lastly, just so I'm clear, the, um, and it's been said before, but the, the money for the hardware and software upgrades was presented in the budget under the IT budget. 
Yes. And so, so the new, so it's not actually, we have it here listed as a new program. I think that that's just a little bit confusing. You may want to, if you Understood. rework this form, I wouldn't call this a new program. Um, it's, it's new to our budget, and so, uh, but it's, it's not new to council and it's not new to the county. Okay, thank you. Councilman Greenspan. Great, thank you. I'm not gonna comment on any one particular item now because I think we're probably gonna have to get back at this, but if anybody's a fan of college football on ESPN on Saturdays where Lee Corso, they do a skit where he keeps saying not so fast, we don't have to do this. I mean, you know, I think I, my recommendation is to council, we look at the restoring funding options and next year, we have the administration come present through chairman's committee, each of these programs in more detail and, uh, and review them then. I don't want to feel rushed into making a decision on a program we literally just got this morning. We need to make a decision within the next 10 days. So I think my recommendation would be to focus on the restoration component and, and, and uh, pass till next year on the new programs. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. Conwell. I'm in agreement with uh, Mr. Greenspan. In, mo in moving forward with the, the Health and Human Service levy, and I don't know the other, my other colleagues, when they went out and they talked to the community about the increases um, of the funding that we needed, I know in my spiel to them, I stated that it was to restore the programs that we already had and that there was no discussion on new programs. Um, and so I'm going to stay true to my word um, to, to each of those constituents that I spoke to in regards to this. So I will definitely not be voting on any uh, of the new programming moving forward until we can, we can come together and it could be brought before the committees and discussed um, like adults are supposed to do. So I will be in agreement with the restore of the funding, but uh, any of the new programming, uh, we should have we knew about this by now for the directors coming before us and, and a few of them may have mentioned uh, things like the IT we're very, very aware of. Um, and my other question, or that was a statement, but my other question, under the IT uh, budget, it was, it's now determined to be pulled out of the PA fund. Was it in the, coming out of the general fund before? Okay, and so that's gonna release those dollar amounts from the general fund what are those general fund dollars? Uh, is there any um, anything in the proposal for those those dollars to be spent? It's, it's that's not uh, my budget, J Jeff. I'm sure we'll we'll reexamine that issue when he's available, assuming council accepts these uh, proposals. Okay, Councilman Tron. Yeah, and just just to disagree a little bit with with Dave on that. As far as the IT piece, I hope we can carve that out because like. Uh, like Julian said, that that's really not a new proposal. It's it's just uh, taking it, it's a fungible item coming from one part of the budget, but I would still like to hear why it should be coming out of the PA fund for purposes of determining whether or not that makes sense for, for this body to take it out of one fund, because we're the, we're the fiscal uh, folks who are watching the fiscal side of the aisle on, on this, and I would love to hear as to why we think that that is going to be applicable to get uh, grant funding. If it is, hey, I'm all for I'm all in favor of choosing a different bucket if that's if that's what it means to to uh, to be able to do that. But uh, disagreeing with Dave that we we should only talk about their their restoration. I think if that's a uh, a change, I think I would like to see us at least have that conversation or have somebody present to us uh, how or what what applications, what grants they think uh, that this is going to be used as a matching uh, component to it. Okay. Well, this uh, this brings us to our lunchtime. And uh, so, uh, well, I do have one question, if I, if I might. please. Uh, just clarification on the TANF, uh, the um, PA fund, are they strictly or 100% TANF funds, unused dollars, but they are from TANF? Is that correct? Give me clarification. Uh, to the to the councilman, to the chair, I may I may defer to OBM because there there could be other sources of funding that are included in the PA fund. It's my understanding that generally speaking, when the county uh, pr provides a serv service and gets federal reimbursement back, when those funds come back to us, they go into the PA fund. 
much of that is, is TANF, but some could be Medicaid, some could be other areas as well. So I, I, I don't want to I don't want to get too far down that because that's a more technical question that I feel confident in answering. And uh, in the mix, mix and part B to that question is on the restored funding. Uh, what percentage of what was the original amount that was taken out, and how much of this is being restored? Uh, to the councilman through the chair, the, the original amount proposed for reductions, I believe we had uh, approximately $6.8 million in reductions for 2014 and about $8.9 million in, in 2015. But, um, you know, those aren't, those aren't the same numbers you see here, so I think there, there could be some, uh, th there could be some additional dollars that we didn't, that I didn't include in my, my initial figures, but I can get that for you. And I would like to know if the Office of Reentry was one of those um, departments that was, was uh, reduced, and because I don't see them on the restored funding list. So I'd like to know where they fall in that mix, if they were reduced or not. There was no proposed cut to the Office of Reentry. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to recess until 1.15, and uh, we, have, uh, we have lunch in, in the back room. I think there, uh, there may be enough for some, at least some of the administration to join us. So, uh, too much money. <laughs> too much money as is. so uh, we stand recessed. <laughs>